Our last speaker of the day, Nick James, who is uh, director of the Comets section. But today he's not talking about Comets particularly, uh, but his uh, experiments with uh, video cameras and uh, videoing the whole sky. Uh, Nick is also uh, well known as an eclipse chaser, and uh, he's, uh, he's been the paper secretary of the BAA in the past, and uh, he works in the spacecraft industry, um, working on the communications systems. Uh, so he knows a lot about technology. He's going to talk about this uh, very useful technology now. Thank you, David. And uh, th thanks, everyone, for holding on to the end of the day. I know that uh, Hazel's kind of a bit twitchy at the back because we've got to have the time to do the raffle at the end. So I will try and get through this reasonably quickly. Um, I've had a bit of a disorganized visit, actually, because I thought I was flying up from Luton and ended up, actually, I'd booked from Gatwick. So luckily I found that out before I came. <laughs> and then... I thought I was talking about the comet section until I went on the BAA website two days ago and found out that I was talking about monitoring the sky with video cameras. So I've put this talk together. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, it's, it's again us being able to benefit from technology that's developed for something else. So everyone these days has got security cameras stuck outside their houses wherever monitoring their dogs, cats, hedgehogs, cars, whatever. These security cameras are incredibly, incredibly sensitive now. Um, now this, this talk's got a lot of videos in, hopefully it'll run. Yeah, this is running. So uh, this is an example of one of these little color security cameras running at night. You can see there's the plow up there. This thing going on over here is a propellant dump from a Centaur upper stage of a rocket, an Atlas Centaur rocket that launched a Landsat satellite. Um, now I have this camera to monitor my telescope that's down the bottom of the garden, so I can watch it while I'm doing my observing inside and everything else I'm doing, but it records permanently and it picks up all kinds of interesting stuff. And that's pretty cool, isn't it? That's, that's the propellant. This, this is actually a deorbit burn and propellant dump from a Centaur upper stage. Now quite a few people saw that visually, I didn't but I've got a recording of it. And if you set up like I have, your house with loads and loads of cameras, I look, the telescope's slewing around to look at something else there. Loads and loads of cameras looking at the sky, you will be amazed by the kinds of things that you see. These cameras are incredibly cheap. They're pretty easy to set up. And hopefully in the next few minutes, I can just show you what's involved. So, they all come from China, of course. Every, every single piece of technology we get these days comes through the Suez Canal in containers. And so there are, you will have heard from many people, supply chain issues with stuff that come from China, but you can still buy these things. They're about 30 quid each. What you get for your money is the camera sensor, which looks quite tiny, but it's a high definition video camera sensor. It's actually a Sony, what's called a Sony Starvis chip. Now, a few years ago, professionals used what were called back thin CCDs. So very, very sensitive CCDs. And these things cost an absolute fortune. You can now for 30 pounds get a back thin CC CMOS sensor, which has a quantum efficiency of about 80 odd percent um, and generates a video signal. And the thing about these is that unlike old security cameras, where you basically connected each camera together with a piece of coax cable to a VHS video recorder, these things have got a processor on them, and what they do is they generate a digital stream, uh, an MPEG stream that you can connect to from a computer and just record. Um, so you get these from China. They are color sensors, so they have a Bayer matrix like the, the, the Bayer matrix in your camera, your, your normal photographic camera. Well, they're specially designed so that all of these Bayer filters actually have about the same response once you get into the infrared. And the reason for that is that when you're doing your security camera stuff, you'll have seen people with security cameras, they have infrared illuminators at about 840, 850 nanometers. That's the wavelength of the LEDs in those cameras. And so these cameras operate in a black and white mode in infrared, and they can operate in a color mode um, uh, during the daytime. And the, and the difference is you have an IR cut filter. So if you put this IR cut filter in, you get the color RGB matrix. So you've got a choice with these cameras. You can either have them operating in a color mode 
where they're not brilliantly sensitive, or you can take out the IR cut filter and have them operate in a black and white mode where they are incredibly sensitive. So I've got a whole bunch of these cameras around, um, all made from bits that you can order from China online, and they come remarkably quickly, unless they do get stuck in the Suez Canal, which has happened a few times. The lenses are amazing. These are four or six millimeter focal length lenses. They're quite fast. They're f.95. They are incredibly sharp lenses. These things, I mean, I did meteor camera astronomy years ago with really expensive lenses. These things cost six quid each and they produce pinpoint star images in a high definition video. Absolutely amazing. So the whole camera, the, the little plastic dome thing, the camera board, the lens, the cable comes to about 50 pounds. This isn't super expensive astronomy. This is this is you know, pretty cheap astronomy. You order it from this wonderful site called AliExpress, which I know many of you have got kids you probably know this because you can order all sorts of junk off this site, but you can also order all sorts of really interesting stuff as well. Don't be scared by the fact it comes from China. You order it. It generally will come within a few weeks. The the various changes to the VAT rules and other things mean actually you don't now get stung for customs duties because you actually have to pay the VAT all up front when you order these things. But it's a really economical way of, of getting stuff. So you can order the camera boards, the lenses, the domes, everything from this site. You can actually put the cameras either in old fashioned conventional CCTV mountings like this, or you can put them in these domes. These are plastic, acrylic. Um, they seem to be pretty stable in sunlight. Optically, they're good enough. They're not as good as an optical window, but they're pretty good. And the, these things you can order from China, the actual um, containers for about seven or eight pounds, I think they are. So, so you, can, you can buy a bulk buy, get lots of cameras and connect them all up. So there are various ways of using these, but they're actually pretty simple to use. The, the cameras themselves use what's called power over Ethernet. So when you use an Ethernet cable to connect your laptop to your router, for instance, data goes up and down that cable. What you can do is you can also put um, electricity voltage to run the camera over that, and that's called power over Ethernet. And there's two ways of using your cameras with power over Ethernet. You can either buy what's called a power over, over Ethernet switch, which is like a, an Ethernet router switch, but which provides the power to the camera. eBay will get you one of those for 30 or 40 quid. You can connect your cameras to that. Or if you've only got one or two cameras, you can use a PO, what's called a PoE inserter, which inserts the power into the camera. Then at the other end, <coughs> You need a computer of some kind to actually do something with the video. Um, I, I, I have various things running, so I have what's called a digital video recorder. And a digital video recorder is the kind of modern equivalent of what was the old VHS video recorder, but it records digital video streams and it will record multiple streams. So I've got actually, I think six or seven cameras currently recording to my DVR. In a, in a loop, so they keep stuff for about seven days. So I've got video recordings in seven different directions that are kept for seven days. So I pick up pretty much everything there is in the sky. You can also run this wonderful software called RMS, which I'll talk about a little in a minute, which is the, um, it's a meteor detection software that runs on a Raspberry Pi. And a Raspberry Pi is a really nice little, little computer. Oops, I'll show you that in a sec. Um, but they're quite difficult to get now. So this Meteor software actually detects meteors in, in video in real time and does all sorts of interesting stuff for you. So I've got a few examples of what you can get with these cameras. So first example is the color mode. Um, we mentioned, Sandra mentioned NLC, Ken mentioned NLC. Well, um, most of the NLC happen when I'm asleep. Um, so I have a camera on in the northeast of my house that just looks to the northeast. So here's Capella look, here's Perseus, and here's a display of NLC happening. 
And so this is just recorded continually, um, day and night, day and night through the summer, um, just recording NLC. So I'm able to send Ken reports of whether I've seen NLC from Chelmsford um, when I wake up and I have my breakfast the next morning. And you can get, you know, really quite impressive images from these cameras. They're quite sensitive. In the black and white mode, they are remarkable. Now, this is a very noisy picture. It's really stretched, but you can actually see the Milky Way here. It looks a lot better on the screen, actually, than it does here. But um, in the black and white mode, you get really good sensitivity. So this is from my garden in Chelmsford uh, with a four millimeter lens. This is 25 frames a second. If you keep your eye there, I don't know whether you can see it, but there's an object which appears and this is real time video and then disappears again. Anyone Id any idea what that might be? Yeah, you know, I told you that the other day. So <laughs> thank you. Yes, it's, it's a reflection from a geostationary satellite. But this is this is real time, 25 frames per second video of the night sky from my rather light polluted garden in Chelmsford, just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. Um, the other thing that's quite neat about having all these cameras is you go away on holiday, as I was, I was on La Palma, I was halfway up the mountain in La Palma and I got this email from Dennis, who said that he'd been out, because he does proper observing, he actually goes out in the cold and looks yeah. up at the sky. He, he'd been out, looked up at the sky and he'd seen this fuzzy object moving across the sky well, what could it possibly be? So there I was sitting by the pool in uh, La Palma. I thought, okay, I'll log into my computer at home and have a look at the video for the time that Dennis reported. And this is what I had on my video. So here's Capella again down there. You can see it's quite cloudy in Chelmsford, but look at this thing. So this is what Dennis observed. And it just happened to be recorded on my video because I've got loads of cameras and they're always looking at the sky. So we found out what it was eventually. So this is again a spacecraft, this time a Russian one. This is a launch of a Russian um, rocket called Angara, um, which at this point was again doing a propellant dump as it went over the UK. And so what you see is this expanding cloud of gas coming from the, from the rocket upper stage as it goes over. So that's great fun, you know, gets reported from up in Tarbot Ness, goes all the way down to La Palma in Spain. I log into my computer in Chelmsford, say, yes, Dennis, he did actually see something. It wasn't just that you drunk too much uh, of the local brew. And yeah, so that, that, is, that is that. And um, there's this guy called Jonathan McDowell, who actually ident said, you know, maybe people will see this. It's a pretty small object, but maybe people will see it. And yes, we did, and we've got the video to prove it and the photos as well. Of course, these cameras are really good for looking at meteors. Uh, the Perseids this year was affected for, for most visual observers by the fact it occurred at full moon, but the cameras are always looking and there's a wonderful network called the Global Meteor Network. This is a network run uh, by a number of people around the world who've written some really neat software that analyze that video in real time the software either runs on Raspberry Pis or it can run under Linux on a normal PC. And that software actually analyzes it frame by frame, detects meteors, sends the information off to a central server where it can get combined with the, the, the detections from stations all over the country and all over the world. And you can then triangulate on the meteors and produce very precise orbits. And within the UK, uh, there are lots of stations. There are a number of networks in the UK involved in this. So UKMON is a, is a big network, which is the, the network that has most of the stations. We, we've also got other networks like Nematode. But as you can see, there are a lot of stations in England, not so many up here in Scotland. So you guys need to, to pull your socks up really and get some stuff installed up here because there's a big area of the British Isles, which is not being covered at the moment. And it would be really, you know, there's so many cameras in England now that adding more cameras in England doesn't add much to what's going on. But certainly up here in the northeast of Scotland and up the west coast as well, 
a uh, good idea to, to get some more cameras. My, my camera's down here in Chelmsford. I've got four Meteor cameras, and these are the areas of, uh, of uh, the surface of the Earth that we cover. So this is essentially the visibility I've got at 100 kilometers up. Now, Dennis is up here, up on the Port Mahoma, uh, Port Mahoma on that peninsula on the other side of the Firth here. Um, I've actually got common meteors with him. So it's about, from my observatory to Dennis's, is about 750 kilometers, as the very tired crow flies. <laughs> and we've actually picked up meteors simultaneously on our cameras and got orbits. But the great thing about this is that you can produce a huge amount of science again with very very simple very limited technology so this is a raspberry pi essentially the raspberry pi is a very small but very capable computer and it can run that rms software and connect to those cameras and do all the stuff that's needed to calculate the information that gets sent off so that the central server can calculate orbits and here again is another video Oof. That's what happens when you get a meteor. And so I've got these cameras running all the time, recording permanently if meteors happen. It's all there in the data. That's an aircraft down there. I get a lot of those. I live not far from Stansted Airport, and this is actually looking towards Stansted. Um, but it's just a great way of doing stuff. And if you're, I'm away quite a lot, and I'm also quite lazy, it's quite nice. <laughs> It's quite nice to have all of this video there because if stuff happens, if there's a bright fireball or satellite propellant venting or whatever, I can go back and look at my video and, and I've got a recording of it. And quite often that's really useful to work out what's going on. This is the maximum night of the Perseids. This is the 13th of August, 12th, 13th of August. This is a composite that you can get from that RMS software, which takes all of the detected meteors and a few aircraft as well. So these things with flashes in the middle of aircraft. But you can see quite nicely that all the Perseids are actually radiating from, from a point up there in Perseus. Um, this is what you can get from GMN almost in real time. This is about a day after the observations are made. And it's plotting the detections of all of the meteors over the UK and Europe from the cameras. So this is a really great thing to do. It's really interactive. You get to see how well your cameras are doing, what other people are doing, but it contributes hugely to science as well. You can get uh, this. This is a, a plot of my detection of Perseids through the um, early part of the shower. We had extraordinary weather in the southeast of England where there was about two weeks of clear skies, um, which was amazing. Just after maximum, the weather changed and we got cloud, but got really good coverage beforehand. But it's things like this that I, I think is just absolutely amazing. Time. The, this is a plot of um, every dot here is uh, a meteor who's had its orbit calculated by the GMN software. So every dot represents a tiny little meteoroid that's come into the Earth's atmosphere where there's enough information from multiple cameras to work out its orbit before it hit the atmosphere. So we can project it back into space to where it came from. The dots are color coded in this case, in terms of the date relative to the Perseid maximum. So Perseid maximum on the 13th of August is, is here. So what you can see, and we know this happens anyway, is that the, because of the fact the earth is going around the sun and the way that it intersects with the orbit of, of the comet, but the radiant moves. The radiant actually moves through uh, maximum and then moves to the other side. But you can see it's very smooth. Uh, and in the past, people have thought that maybe there are clumps in the, in the Perseid stream. Well, you can see that's not the case from here. But an amazing statistic is that there, this is, there are 23,000 dots on this plot. What that means is that the GMN cameras over the three or four weeks of the Perseids have detected and computed the orbit of 23,000 little meteoroids that have been going, flying through space that have come off the comet that is the cause of these meteors, which is Swift-Tuttle. 
A hundred years ago, George Alcock, who was mentioned earlier, and Manning Prentice, did this job manually. They observed, and Neil Bone was mentioned earlier as well. So Neil Bone was a director of the meteor section in the BAA. He used to say that all you needed to be a meteor observer was basically a deck chair, a piece of string, a clipboard and a pencil, because that's the way that people used to, use to observe meteors. But Prentice and Alcock did this job. They did it visually. They, they, they went out and they observed meteors and they, they observed at the same time. They were looking in the appropriate direction that they would see the same object. They would record it manually. And then Prentice would compute the orbit of the meteor. And they would, over, the, over a period like the Perseids, maybe get five, six, seven good meteor orbits with a huge amount of work. We get 23,000 by setting up a load of really low cost cameras around around the world. It so happens that that primarily because of the work that UK Mon have done, the UK or at least England has got the highest density of coverage of cameras anywhere in the world. And about, I think it's about 40% of those orbits are actually of meteors over England. Now just think if we can expand up that camera network, how many more orbits we'll get. But it, it's remarkable, the technology is just remarkable, all from these really cheap cameras. The other thing is that we're getting new meteor streams discovered. So I think probably most people know that most meteors come from comets and they come from comets because of the dust that comes off the nucleus of the comet, goes down the tail, goes into the orbit behind the comet and then if we're in the right place at the right time and that intersects the Earth's atmosphere, we see meteors. Now, because of the number of cameras there are around now, you can actually look for clumping in, in meteor events and actually discover new meteor streams. And this is an example of one, uh, I think this is the Delta Capricornids that was seen in late August, um, where it was announced on an IAU circular that this new stream had been seen just for one night. And we went back and looked in GMN data, the database is online, anyone can download it. And here you can see very clearly the clumping of these objects. Now, in this case, the, the dots represent the velocity of the meteors as they come into the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see there's a nice clump of objects, all of which have the same velocity coming in from the same radiant. So that's a new meteor shower, and it was only visible for one night. So these cameras are doing fantastic science on something that's the size of a well, in the old days, you'd describe it as the size of a fag packet, as you know, a really small camera, 30, 30 millimeter square camera board with a small lens. Um, we measure all sorts of things. So this is, again, for those, the Perseids, this is a plot of the geocentric and heliocentric velocity of those particles. Uh, and that changes slightly depending on, on where the Earth is in the orbit and, and its rotation phase. Really nice plots, and because there are so many of these things detected, we've got fantastic statistics. We can do really detailed statistical analysis of these, these objects. And do lovely plots like this. this is another example of GMN. It keeps a, an almost real-time heat map of where meteor streams are detected. And that gets updated regularly on the website, and again, comes from all of these cameras that people are running all around the world. So that's it. I've gone through really quickly, so I hope we've got enough time for the raffle. I've got a couple of other videos which I'll show you as we get the raffle set up. One of the things about having these cameras is you can do time lapses and the software automatically generates these time lapses at the end of each night. This is an example time lapse from my Northwest camera. There's a, there's a spider that is a real pain. Spiders are a real nuisance actually with, with these cameras. And I've never found a way of getting rid of them. And RSX spiders are really hard. You try and get rid of them and they just come back. But this is a time lapse running through the night. You see all of the aircraft. You also see lots of satellites on this, which are the fainter trails. And the quick flashes are meteors, Perseid meteors. So this is all the way through the night, looking to the northwest from my, my place. Um, on Perseid maximum night, which is when there was a full moon up there, which is why the sky is quite bright. 
And then after this, there's another video, which is uh, looking the other way. Oh, that was that bright meteor. Another video looking the other way, which was a few days earlier when there's no moon. So what I'll do is I'll let these run and we can do the raffle whilst they're running. So, and then I'll take, if anyone's got any questions, I can probably take them if there's time after the raffle. Is that, is that okay yeah, that way? Fine. Right. So do, do people just choose what they want? They come up. So if, if, if you if you win, you can just come up and pick the item that you want. All right. Lyman. So I think that's, is there a Gareth Brown in the house? Ah. <laughs> I installed a new camera 20 miles west of Aberdeen about three weeks ago. Right, <laughs> excellent, that's really good. So is that one of the same, those are It's on cameras? there, yeah, we'll go through the plate path. It's, right. it's actually running already. Brilliant, places, you'll so. find it totally addictive. Once it's, you've got one of them going, it's you'll, want to buy, exactly. you'll want yeah. to buy more and more and more yeah. until you run out of money. Yeah, yeah, just take, yeah. <laughs> I'll pick another one, because that does mean I'll have to read it, doesn't it? No, no I can do that one. <laughs> Probably. One. Is that Milton Tan? Milton Tan? No? Tim? Tan? No, it doesn't. Yeah, Tim Milton, that is. Tim Milton. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, going to drive to a distillery, that doesn't sound very good. Right. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Uh, mountain and so they, they seem to generate certainly in the southeast of England they seem to generate enough heat to keep them free of dew I, I guess that might be different here in the middle of the winter I suspect um, 
people who have had problems. So people use them in Canada where they have had problems and you can, with the power over ethernet, you can actually get 12 volts out and you can use it to run a little heater. So you can't, you can't take too much power from that POE, but I think people can take enough out to keep the dew away. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I mean, the, the, I, I used to run cameras where I actually had a proper CCTV enclosure that had a fan and a heater and whatever. What I've got now is just either those little domes or uh, enclosures which are open to the air at the bottom. Um, and they seem, they seem, the cameras in themselves seem to generate enough heat to keep you away. To put them very close to the glass at the front. But I think it will depend on what your local conditions are like, I guess. Is there a place to go? Oh. Just, just go from the back and then forward. Uh, no, so the power, the whole idea of the power over Ethernet is it's got to go over a physical cable. So you've got to get, you've got to get power there somehow. The, the way that some of the, by the way, that's Jupiter, that thing there. Um, the way that some of the people who use Raspberry Pis use these is that they, you can actually put a Wi-Fi adapter on a Raspberry Pi. So you can put the Raspberry Pi and the camera remotely away from somewhere. But the point is you still need to power it somehow. So you know, usually the thing is, because you've got to get power to the camera, you might as well run a network cable to it. Sorry, is there a guide to the camera? Yeah, um, there, yeah. So one of the problems with all sky cameras with these things is actually getting a lens that's reasonably fast, that's a short focal lens. Um, the short, the best I found, I think, is a 1.4 millimeter focal length lens. Again, you can get it from Ali. Um, they're about f2.5, something like that. So they're reasonably good. Um, in terms of guides to doing it, if you look on the GMN site, there's quite a lot of stuff from people who've used, because GMN generally uses these four and six millimeter lenses, but there are some people who've done all sky cameras. And in fact, Who's the, who's the guy who gave a talk to the BAA recently, who's from up around here? Um, yeah, Eric, Eric Walker. So yeah, I mean, Eric, Eric, Eric's site is a good place to go to look at that. I mean, his, his All Sky is somewhat different because he's using a, a, a larger chip with static rather than video, but yeah. You could consider writing an article about how you make these cameras and you could publish it in the Equipment and Techniques newsletter or or somewhere. You, 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 can buy them ready you can. So you came on. So you you came on who are the uh, big uh, UK meteor network who actually support GMN in the UK. Um, they they will actually make you a turnkey camera. So if you if you don't feel confident enough to make your own, then they will do it for you. But honestly, it is really simple. Um, I mean, I know some people are really, you know not wanting to touch electronics or anything like that, but it is pretty simple to do. There, there's there's good descriptions of how to do it online. Follow those and, and it will work. Okay, and, anything else? Right. Well, that's the end of the meeting then. I have to uh, thank a few people. Let's uh, another round of applause. Yes. Uh, we, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Lorna Leal and Kirsty Fraser, who are the event coordinators for this uh, university, and also Wendy for uh, managing the recordings. Uh, Megan and her catering company for the refreshments and lunches. Amazing cakes we had just at, just at the last break there. I'd like to thank the speakers, of course, very much. The section directors who brought some displays. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Maddie in the BAL office and Andy Wilson for his uh, work on the IT systems, the booking system. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming. I'd like to thank most of all Hazel Collett. Is Hazel here? Oh, let's Thank you very much, Hazel, for all the fantastic work. And this has been a, a, meet, a meeting which has uh, been so much delayed and its preparations had to be made several times. And also, of course, uh, Mori Astronomy Society. 
club. They're, they're a club. <laughs> Moya Family Club. And uh, yes, uh, we, we hope to see many of you. Uh, I, I said that to some people who come up here from far flung place, places as Bournemouth and Essex. So I hope to see some of you in Winchester as next year. Uh, and uh, all have a good journey home. Thank you. Thank you